very much for being here. I have to tell you that this has been a really fun day for me. I've had a great time. At any time, you can walk into a high school auditorium and there are 450 high schoolers that are just, you know, crawling up the walls and, and from different schools. We probably had about three or four different schools involved in this, a line of buses and Wiley had them in rapture, so I was really happy about that. And then the line for his autograph was just stretched around, and the kids were climbing all over each other for selfies, so <laughs> go figure. It's a wonderful thing when a, when, a, when a rider is a rock star, let me tell you. You can be very, very happy. Well, we do have a wonderful, dynamic guy here today. Wally Cash is, uh, I have, before I, I ever met Wiley and had the opportunity to talk to him in, in depth like we have in the past day or so. Um, I read everything that he wrote. I've read everything that has been written about him. And uh, I'll tell you a little story. Um, Wiley, well, he's young for one thing. Wiley Cash is the same age as my daughter, so you know it begins to age you right there and date you right there. But about, I don't know, maybe eight or ten years ago, he came here because he wanted to see Bobby Ann Mason, and we were featuring her, and he came to the readings, and then he also submitted a story to uh, the Bobby Ann Mason volume. I think that was like the third or fourth volume that we had of the anthology, and he was a really good writer, but I have to tell you something. He's a great writer now. Uh, you are going to enjoy tonight, and I would encourage you to come to events uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow we have things going on all day long. I see some of the Senior Moments people here. So we're going to be at Senior Moments Book Club. These ladies, uh, uh, the fondest image I have is Frank X. Walker, who's an African-American writer. He's sitting in the middle of these ladies, and they're all admiring Frank, and he is just overjoyed by the attention that he's getting. So it'll be Wiley on the hot seat tomorrow there. But the things that, you can't come to that unless you're a member of, of Senior Moments. But uh, we have had plenty of opportunity. We have plenty of opportunities for you to be able to to listen to Wiley and to talk with him. Uh, we have a really interesting thing happening tomorrow at three o'clock, and that is the uh, writers' master class. Uh, we have people have have submitted things to read for that master class. It's based upon uh, my daughter was a music major, so it's based upon the music master class, and it's really kind of cool. It ends up being, it has in the last few years, being a really wonderful discussion about what makes good writing. So I hope students come to that. But community people as well, and we want the community people to be involved in that. And then tomorrow evening, we have the writers, uh, the uh, Scarborough Lecture. And <clears throat> that will be uh, where we give the Appalachian Heritage Writers Award. Uh, I have a lot of people to thank tonight. <coughs> And uh, the uh, West Virginia Center for the Book is the main one. They do sp help sponsor that award. They sponsor the anthology that we have. Uh, the Frank, uh, the uh, Charles Fraser anthology is what we celebrated last night. And you get a chance to go to Fort Seasons Bookstore and pick that up. You really will enjoy it. It's filled with uh, what we have about seven Weatherford Award winners, two poet laureates in that. And we had a wonderful reading last night with uh, Gretchen Moran Laskus, who was one of our writers a few years ago and gave us a story for that book, and uh, Mark Harshman, who is our West Virginia Poet Laureate. So that book is on sale at Four Seasons. Please go and pick that up. You will enjoy it. It's a really quality, excellent, excellent book. And I will say this, which I didn't say last night, and I should have. We really don't get funding uh, for the Appalachian Studies program and the things that we do. We get it by virtue of the talent of people like Brianna sitting back there on the second to the last row, McGuire, uh, students and dedicated people like Natalie, who's sitting up here on the third row, who are editors of the anthology. And the anthology really pays our way for the programs we get, the guests that we bring in, the really unique things we offer in Appalachian Studies. I don't think there really is a, a degree, a minor, or a program, or a graduate certificate that is anything like Appalachian Studies, so we are definitely in tune and connected with uh, the region. Well, tonight you are in for a treat. There are lots and lots of things, opportunities for you to have to enjoy Wally Cash and others as well, but tonight we get to hear about the writer's life. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Wiley Cash.
Don't sit there. Don't sit there. Don't sit there. Don't care. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't resist. She kind of jumped instead of sneaking in. Usually when I'm teaching and a student comes in late, I'll wait for them to sit down and then I'll say, does anybody else have anything to say about John? <laughs> no? Okay. All right. We can, we can keep going. Welcome. I'm sorry. She's like, I'm not buying your book now. <laughs> thank you for that, for that welcome, Sylvia. And thank you all so much for having me. This is uh, it's a big deal for me to be back in Shepherdstown. This is my third trip. Uh, Sylvia said I came to see Bobby Ann Mason. I believe it was in, uh, I think it was in 2008 or 2009 that I was here. And I was so impressed by the university and by this beautiful town that a couple of years later, my wife, who's here tonight, um, we came back and we vacationed and spent some time in Shepherdstown. And so this is my third time in town. And she came with me. We have two little girls. And uh, they came with me as well, as did my mom, who was with our two little girls. Hopefully they're all sleeping. <laughs> Even my mom. Maybe, I don't know. She had a little bit of wine before we left the house. So she may be asleep, right? Um, but today I got to do uh, some, some amazing things. I got to visit my three favorite institutions in American civic life. I got to go to school, I got to go to the library, and I got to go to the bookstore. And those are three places that have changed my life. So I want to thank uh, Shepherd University for having me in the, the, the high schools in Martinsburg. And I want to thank uh, the, the public library there in Martinsburg. And I want to thank Four Seasons Book and, and Kendra is here today. It's just an incredible bookstore. You guys have a real asset in this community in Four Seasons Books. They're, um, and I, when I was there today, I told the, the fellow Mike, I believe his name is, I said, I can tell by looking at your shelves that you know who your readers are. It's a very curated bookstore. So, Shepherdstown, whether you know it or not, that bookstore reflects you. So go there and find out who you are, if you don't know. <laughs> so tonight I thought I would talk a little bit about the writer's life, which is glamorous. <laughs> glamorous. We arrived last night in our rented minivan at dark. We're staying in West Back Alley, which is not marked. I think, I think in, in, in the town charter they were like, Put as, as few street signs in town as you can, and make sure it's always dark. <laughs> do we put uh, address numbers in the houses? No, let's don't do that either. Let's don't do, and let's put a lot of the buildings behind other buildings. <laughs> so we were, we were combing West Back Alley with our cell phone flashlights, with our babies, in our rented minivan, and my mom, who was sober, thankfully. My mom didn't, my mom didn't even drink. If she was here, she would just be she would die. Um, not before the girls are in bed, though. Hopefully. Um, but, you know, here we are. This is how glamorous the writer's life is. I'm like, oh, I've got this thing to do tomorrow. We're going to have to live in the van tonight. I know where to shower. And we were like, we were so aware of how close we were to the house. Like, we knew it was just right there, but we didn't know how to get to it, really. And we for sure couldn't see it. So we, we eventually found it when I approached this very nice woman who was just trying to get out of her car like a normal person in a dark alley. A crazy man, road weary, ran up and said, excuse me, um, where do you live? And she was like, <laughs> and then my next statement was like, I'm not crazy, which is what crazy people say when they like, want you to trust them. Like, I'm not crazy. And I said, I'm renting a house, and it's one, two, three. And she's like, well, this is one, two, oh, so it's there. And I was like, there's nothing there. It's just a lot. And she's like, look behind the garage. <laughs> so the, the writer's life is glamorous indeed. Um, but so uh, aside from the glamour of the writing life, I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, writing a land more kind than home. Uh, the circumstances of my life when I began writing that, and then the circumstances of my life once the book was accepted for publication. Uh, we have another West Virginia author here, Natalie Seifold, has had a book accepted. So. Um, all your dreams are about to be crushed in the next hour. So, uh, I'll talk about what it's like to have a book come out and then kind of what you do once the book is, is out in the world. Um, so I began writing uh, Land More Kind Than Home in the spring of 2004. I was living in Lafayette, Louisiana. And I'd gone down to Lafayette for graduate school. Has anybody ever been to Lafayette, Louisiana? Okay, a few people. Lafayette is in Cajun country. You know, we think of... Uh, Louisiana is being all New Orleans, and Lafayette and New Orleans are, are, are not very similar towns. Lafayette is very rural. It's a nice little cosmopolitan city, but maybe 100,000, give or take. But it's a very rural place. 
Then it's a Cajun city. The Acadians settled there, and they are Cajun. So the food is different. The music is Zydeco. Um, the celebrations are different. And I chose to go to graduate school in Lafayette, Louisiana for two reasons. The first reason is because I wanted to go as far into the geographic south as I could. I spoke about this today, so forgive me if you were there. Um, you can just play it on your phone for the next five minutes. I've already heard this. If we're reading pots on today, it's fine. Um, but I wanted to go as far into the geographic south as I could. I'm from North Carolina, which I thought was the south until I went to Louisiana. And they were like, where are you from? North Carolina? Mm. <laughs> It does have the word north in it. No, it's in the south. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Can you play an accordion? No? Mm. I don't think you I don't think you can live here. You have to leave. Okay. But I wanted to go have a cultural experience that was very different from the one I had growing up in the western part of North Carolina. And I got down to Lafayette and realized that there is no such thing as the South. Right? We say the South, we say the Midwest, we say the Northeast, we say the Mid-Atlantic, uh, we say the West Coast, but there is no such thing as any of those places. In America, there are just Souths. Right? The South in Lafayette, Louisiana, is not like the South in Asheville, North Carolina. And now that I think of it, the South in Asheville, North Carolina is not like the South in Wilmington, North Carolina, where we now live on the coast. So my first day in Lafayette, I was attacked by fire ants. It was like 190 degrees, and the street signs were in French, and I found myself asking, why did I move here? You know, why did I come to this place? And then my dad, you know, found out that they did not serve or sell Sundrop in Louisiana, a, a, a taste born in the Carolinas, and he said, you're right in wondering that. Why did you move to Louisiana? I thought I knew you until now. Did you not check to make sure they sold some drop in, in Louisiana? And when my parents would come down and visit, my dad would, they would always like rent a car. And then he would say, come out in the driveway. There's something I want to show you. And he'd pop the trunk and like pull back a blanket and there'd be a 12 pack of uh, sun drop. Like he had just smuggled something, you know, <laughs> across the border. And he wanted to like secret it into my house. And so, you know, once that sun drop hit the streets, I could move a good amount of product before the heat got turned on. But I was able to get enough people interested, so now it's street legal. They sell it there, so my, you know, the, the, the demand's falling for the, the black market of it. But So that was the, the, the geographic reason I went down to Louisiana. The other reason was because I wanted to study under a writer named Ernest J. Gaines, who wrote novels like A Lesson Before Dime. Um, he wrote the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. Um, the Gathering of, Old, Gathering of Old Men. I first read Ernest Gaines when I was a sophomore at the University of North Carolina Asheville, which is in the mountains of North Carolina. And I read his story collection, Bloodline. And like all young writers who read a lot, I was immediately influenced by what I read. And so I immediately wrote a story about a young black man who's working on a sharecropping plantation, you know, just west of Baton Rouge using a machete. I had never, like, held a machete in my hand. I'd seen Crocodile Dundee. That was, like, as close to a machete as I'd ever gotten. But I'd been so influenced and so filled up by the beauty of this writing, by the beauty of the landscape and the style of the writing, I thought, well, that's something I want to do. And I think that all writing is an act of mimicry. I think you're mimicking the writers that you've read, and you're, you're trying to mimic the life around you. Um... And that's what I was doing. And so I went down there to go as far south as I could and to study under Ernest J. Gaines. And I got down there and realized that I was in a place that felt very alien to me and very foreign to me. And again, I thought there was one south. And then I go down to Lafayette and realize there are many souths. And I, I compare it to when you're doing laundry um, and you find a sock and it's black. And you say, I think it's black. Let me hold it up against this sock that I think is blue, and I'll know for certain what color this sock is. That's what I did with Lafayette in Asheville, North Carolina. I held them side by side in my mind, and I thought, these things are so obviously and so apparently different. I can't believe I ever assumed they would be even the least.
least bit similar. And so I threw myself into life in Lafayette. I would go to, you know, see Zydeco music. I learned to love beef brisket and forget about pork barbecue. <laughs> I fully embraced Mardi Gras. Um, I tried to enjoy having 11 and a half months of summer. And, <laughs> and I did. You know, I love Lafayette. And I, we, we've been back since then, and, and we love Lafayette. But it wasn't home. And I found myself desperately homesick for fresh water, homesick for mountains, for seasons. You know, in this part of the world, the first day of spring, it's going to be spring for three months. The first day of fall, it's fall. In Lafayette, you're like, it's fall. And now it's winter. You know, it's literally, the seasons are so brief, except for that long summer, that you don't get to savor the changes in nature the way you do in a place like Shepherdstown or a place like Asheville. And so I began to go back to things that I had done passively while I lived in North Carolina. I went and I reread books like Look Homeward Angel by Thomas Wolfe. I went and I listened to music, bluegrass music, which has many of the same instruments in it that Zydeco does, but they're just played very, very differently and much faster. Um, I began to look at coffee table books of North Carolina photos. You know, I was like the only graduate student in America that was dropping 50 bucks on a coffee table book. I didn't even own a coffee table. I just had like coffee table books that I ate off of instead of a coffee table. Because I was so desperate to, to, to get a sense of this place that I had not been awake to when I lived in it, right? And I was telling uh, the students today that too often we live passively, but we miss actively, you know? Missing something is being actively engaged with the thing you do not have. But when you have the thing, which in this case was North Carolina, we're oftentimes too passive in our day-to-day -day interactions with it. So I was actively longing for North Carolina. So that fall, the fall of 2003, I was taking a class in Af African American literature, and we were reading uh, a novel called Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin. And at the conclusion of that novel, a young man has uh, a coming through experience or a salvation experience. And it's a very public coming through. Uh, some of you may have been raised in the Baptist church or maybe the, the evangelical church, and you have a public profession of faith. Perhaps there's something else very emotional that accompanies that perfect. Uh, that profession or that awakening. And in Go Tell on the Mountain, there's some questioning about whether this coming through is authentic, or whether the little boy is trying to gain the respect of his father or of his community, or if it's a you know, coming of age experience. In the next class, our professor brought in a story out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it was a current news story about a young boy at an African American storefront church. The kind of church where the preacher gets the call on Friday night, and then he gets a Bible on Saturday, and then he opens a church on Sunday. You know, one of those, like, deeply southern places. Uh, and it was in Milwaukee, but I have no doubt it was part of the migration where these people were probably deeply southern and had deeply southern roots. But at this church in Milwaukee, there was a little boy in the congregation who, are, who had autism. And the people in the, in the church decided they were going to heal him of what they saw as his affliction. And so... On, during a church service, they put him down on the floor, and they laid hands on him, and they prayed. And some of you may be part of the tradition um, where laying hands on somebody is an act of communal power, it's an act of focus, it's an act of engagement, an act of fellowship. And they laid hands on this little boy, but he didn't want to be touched. And so he tried to get away. Well, then they held him down, and then they fought with him. And then people began laying across his body to keep him from moving. And the more he fought, the more people came and tried to assist in his healing. And when it was all done, he had died. Um, and so I was really interested in this, this tragedy. It's obviously a tragedy. But I was interested in a community of believers that would literally believe something to death, that would take their sense of faith that far. I'm so right in my conviction that you're going to die as a result of my, my conviction. And I wanted to tell the story of that little boy. I wanted to tell the story of that community. I wanted to tell the story of that family. 
but I'd never been to Milwaukee. I was a graduate student, and I couldn't afford to go to Milwaukee. I didn't know if they sold Sundrop in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't write about the African-American experience in Milwaukee, because that was something I had no idea how to even begin engaging with or trying to portray on the page. But here I am. I'm in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I'm desperately homesick. And at that time, I was studying under Ernest Gaines, who uh, was born on a plantation just west of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in a little area known as False River. He was born on a plantation in 1933. And it was the same plantation on which his family had been slaves, and then sharecroppers. He was born in an old slave cabin that didn't have electricity. It was an old um, shotgun cabin. And he was raised on that plantation, working the fields, working sugar cane, going out in the swamp, stumping in the swamp. But he showed a particular aptitude for storytelling and for writing and for reading. And he proved himself to stand out amongst his peers and his other family members. And so the family decided they were going to move with him. Some of them were going to move with him. He had, his mother and his stepfather had moved out to San Francisco. His stepfather was in the Merchant Marine. And his mother, I can't remember what she did, but she was employed out there as well. And he was being raised by his aunt. And he had to leave school when he was 15 because there were no schools for black children in this area of Louisiana. And he went out to school in, in California. And it's shocking when I say that because Ernest Gaines is still alive. I was visiting him and his wife this summer. And to say, I know somebody that was, uh, it was illegal for him to go to a public school, and he's still alive, right? His, his parents and his family and him, they paid taxes to a public school that it was illegal for him to go to. It was also illegal for him to go to the public library. And so he moved out to California, and for the first time in his life, he could go to a public library. And he said, wow, I'm desperately homesick. I'm going to go to the public library, and I'm going to read every book by and about African Americans living in southwest Louisiana. And he went to the library and realized there were not only no books about black Americans living in southwest Louisiana, there were no books by or about black Americans, period. And so he decided he was going to write. He was going to write those stories. And he realized that if he wrote about home, he could be home. And when he was a child, he began his, his, his narrative training by writing letters for illiterate people on the plantation. They would want to send a letter to somebody in Mississippi or Alabama or somebody maybe fighting in World War II, one of their children perhaps. And they would say, and they called him EJ, they said, EJ, you know, will you write a letter for me? And he's like, okay, what do you want to say? And they, they say, dear Sylvia, it, I hope you are happy. It has been raining here. I hope it stops. Love, Mom. And he's like, that's it? And they're like, well, what else should I say? Like, what's, what, what happened? So he get, got them to tell their stories, and he began to write their stories down. And so he was able to capture the rhythm of their speech, because he was writing first-person narratives to their children and their, and their you know, relatives. And so he began to retell those stories in, in California. And then he moved back to Louisiana, in 1983, became writer in residence at UL Lafayette. And now he and his wife live back on the plantation on which he was born and raised. They bought part of it. And they built this beautiful house out of cypress wood. They took the church that he had gone to school in and, and worshiped in. It was in the old quarters. They had it moved to his backyard and it was restored. And if you read A Lesson Before Dying or the Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, you can go to the place where he lived and it's there. That's it's, you can go see Miss Jane's tree. You can go see the jail where Jefferson is writing and looking out the window at the sycamore tree. You can go look at the church. You can go walk down the quarters. You can go to the old graveyard. It's still there as well. He owns that, too. He bought that. Because all the slaves are buried there. And it's surrounded by sugarcane fields. And he knew eventually they would, those graves would be plowed under and more sugarcane would be planted. And so here I am in Lafayette, Louisiana. I'm desperately homesick for North Carolina. And I'm studying under my literary hero, who began writing about Louisiana after he left it. And I thought, I can do that. Right? I could take the story about this boy in Milwaukee, and I can move it in to the mountains of North Carolina. 
And once I was able to do that, I was able to do two things. I could tell the story. Because I knew what this landscape looked like. I knew what these people spoke like. I knew how they worshipped. I knew what kinds of communities could keep a story like this quiet and allow it to fester and poison relationships and trust. And I could also go home. I could also write about a place that I cared about. And so I got to have 11 and a half months of summer. And when I sat down to work, I got to have snow. I got to have beef brisket. And when I sat down to work, I got pork barbecue. I got to go listen to Zydeco at the Cajun dance hall. And then I got to listen to bluegrass when I wrote. I got to hear these beautiful Cajun accents that are just so lovely. And I got to write these first person narratives of people who spoke like my dad or my grandmother. And I began to try to tell the story of this young boy who uh, died in a healing service in the mountains of North Carolina. But I had to find a way to tell it. I knew that I wanted to have this be first person. Because I wanted to hear those voices and I wanted to engage with those voices. Because I still heard those voices. I still hear those voices. That makes you sound crazy. But you, you hear the voices you grew up with and you will never forget them. And I heard them and I wanted to put them on the page. Because I wanted to engage with them and be reminded of what they sounded like. So I didn't know who to tell the story. But I decided that I needed parts of the community represented. Because I wanted the story to feel total for the reader. Maybe not for the individual characters or for the individual narrators, but I wanted it to feel complete for the reader. And so I thought, well, i got to have somebody from the family speak. I chose Jess. Jess is nine years old. It's 19, this, the year is 1986, and Jess is nine years old. I happen to be nine years old in 1986. And Jess sees a lot of things in the church that he doesn't quite understand and he doesn't quite agree with. Well, I'm a child of the 1980s. And I grew up a stone's throw away from a little place that will forever be known by three letters, PTL. And when I say that to a group of high school students, they're like, PTL? And I say, yeah, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. And they say, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker? <laughs> Who are they? I say, oh, you missed the shirt. Remember that? I ran into Tammy Faye at the mall for that shirt? And it was just a smear of makeup? <laughs> so I ran into Tammy Faye at the mall. But Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, you know, I came of age during the, the rise of the televangelists in the 1980s, right? Where there were 24-hour networks of praise music and preaching and skits and, and asking for money, the, the number at the bottom, sow your seed. And then we find out what? We find out that they've been stealing millions of dollars from donors. We find out that Jim Baker had an affair with Jessica Hahn, who went on to pose for Penthouse. And then we found out about Jimmy Swagger down in Louisiana. And then we have Jerry Falwell and, and Liberty kind of being the puppet master with all trying to you know, resurrect these guys or push these guys away and do these different things. He took over PTL for a brief moment. But in my church where I was raised, I was raised Southern Baptist. I hear the adults in my church saying things like, nah, the devil's working on Jim, and the devil's working on Jim Baker. And I can remember being nine years old and thinking, He's just a jerk. <laughs> you know? Maybe he's just not a good person. Maybe the devil like got out his Rolodex and he was like, let's hit the bees here, Jim Baker. Oh, he's fine. I'll leave him alone. He's doing a great job. He's, <coughs> he's fine. Let's go on down here to get to the S's Swagger. Well played, Jimmy Swagger. You're good as well. I'm gonna go find somebody, you know, who's actually holy and try to change their life for the worse. So I grew up hearing adults in my church blaming human shortcomings on the unseen hand of evil. And there was no accountability, right? I also grew up in a church where adults during, during the Sunday sermon would get up and confess things to the congregation, affairs, addictions, shortcomings. And I'm a child, and I'm sitting in the, in the, in the audience trying to figure out what to do with this, hearing that the devil made Right, so is the devil a physical being? And you know, I was I was raised in a in a in a in a, in a church where the language is very active. My wife, uh, her family is, is 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 Catholic, and her grandparents are from Long Island. And I'll never forget, we were having dinner. My mom was over at her grandparents' house one night, and they're Italian. This huge Italian feast. You know, her grandmother's like, 
You want to come over for dinner? It starts at 3.30. It ends at midnight. you got to stay the whole time. <laughs> Bring the kids. <laughs> the kids go to bed at 7. You kids are wimps. <laughs> Back in my day, they were shooting people outside the pizza place. <laughs> That's awful. That's awful. That's not true. Um, but we were talking about a, a family that uh, my grandmother-in-law knew. And my mom just is casually eating spaghetti, and she goes, the devil works on families, doesn't he? And my wife's grandmother's like, oh! <laughs> see, that, that language to her is like, oh, does Sandy think the devil's like picking people's locks and going into the house and being like, leave your wife. <laughs> or take the kids and leave him. You know where he keeps the money. Just take it, just go. You know, because, it, because you know, to hear that and you're not from that tradition is, is a surprising thing. And that's the tradition that I would, there's the saying, we talk about the devil like he lives next door. That's actually in my book, because I heard people say those things, right? And so I grew up with that, and Jess is struggling with that as well, because Jess sees things in the church that nobody knows he sees. He knows things about his mother that nobody knows he knows, right? And he's trying to balance, what do I believe, what do I know to be true with what am I told to believe, right? What do I know to be true about Jim Baker? And what am I told to believe about him? When you're nine years old, that's a tough thing to get your head around, right? And so I knew I wanted Jess to represent the family. And Jess is able to perceive more than he's able to understand. And I wanted the reader to never feel quite certain about what they were getting from Jess. I could never want it to be totally clear that he understood everything. And Jess is also the linchpin for a lot of the book. The second uh, part of the community I knew I wanted to be represented was the church. And Adelaide Lyle. Adelaide Lyle is 81 years old. She's a real old school believer. She's tough. She's consistent. She's honest. And she's true. And she knows when Chambliss hits the church and he shows up, she thinks, this is bad. This is bad news. And she sees this once very pure and very staid members of her community do bizarre things or things that she finds to be bizarre and things that others would find to be bizarre. And that's why the newspaper is put up in the windows of this storefront church. She's based on my grandmother. My grandmother's name was Lucille Adeline Edwards. And my grandmother was a fire believer. She was my dad's mom. She was a fiery believer. She was also very pragmatic, and she was very tough. A story I told today, uh, when I was a, a young man in my teens, I had acne. Not like, you know, like a pimple here, pimple here, there, but like soul-crushing acne. And uh, one day, my grandmother was living with us, and my wife had displayed some of, my, of her father's pipes on this piano we had in our house. And I had uh, my girlfriend over, and I was pretending to smoke these pipes and like talking this like corny British accent, like, hello, welcome to my, my pipe store. You want know, to smoke a pipe and hear me play the guitar, the piano? My grandmother comes shuffling in, and we called Nanny, and my grandmother says, Wiley, if you don't quit smoking them pipes, your zits ain't never gonna go away. <laughs> and then she just shuffled out, you know, and I just put the pipe back and went to my room and cried. <laughs> put oxy tin on my face, or whatever, clear sill, whatever we were using back then. But she was also really kind and really giving and really just a really consistent person. And that's, that's who Adelaide is. She's a real believer. And she, 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 her, her words are accompanied by acts. And that's a rare thing. That's a rare thing. And then the other part of the community I wanted to be represented was the community itself. And that, that's where Clem, the sheriff, comes in. He's an outsider. He's only lived in Madison County for 25 years. People here probably wouldn't know anything about that, right? <laughs> But he is the person who's looking in. He's also the rational mind, trying to make sense of a community of believers, trying to make sense of a woman who lost her child but won't talk to the sheriff, and trying to make sense of these things. And so I had the family, the church, and the community. I had the heart, the spirit, and the intellect. And they were all trying to come together to tell you a story, to tell you the fullness of a story. And none of them know everything, but all of them know something. 
And I had other narrators as well that I can talk about later, but I, I ended up getting rid of them. And so I set about writing the novel in that way. And, um, the challenge was to find what is the narrative arc and who needs to speak and tell their story at particular moments in the novel to keep the narrative clicking along with that traditional inciting incident, rising action, climax, falling action, you know, resolution, or whatever that old, that old model is. So I thought tonight I would, I don't know if everyone here has read it. I'm kidding, of course you have. <laughs> I thought I would just read the first 75 pages <laughs> to give you an idea. We don't have the Senior Moments Book Club until noon tomorrow. <laughs> so we'll just be here till then. <clears throat> Chapter one. I thought I would read a little bit of the novel. I thought I would read a section from Clem's narration about the first time um, he heard the name Carson Chambliss, this mysterious minister who has come to town. And the oldest story model, I was flailing about trying to, to write this novel and revise this novel. And a friend of mine who I'm still really good friends with, who was in my, my writing classes and in my, our workshop with Ernest Gaines, he said, remember what Gaines would always say is the oldest story, a stranger comes to town and something happens. So in this novel, I decided to have two strangers, Carson Chambliss, and the return of the grandfather, Jimmy Hall. So I had two strangers, so a lot of stuff happened. But this is the first time the sheriff, uh, this is his story of, of, of learning who Carson Chambliss is. Carson Chambliss suddenly showed up on the radar, and he's, he's remembering the night the barn got burned, when Gillum's barn got burned. Carson Chambliss suddenly showed up on the radar of the Madison County Sheriff's Department, and he'd been there ever since. He didn't seem to have any connections to the area, and there wasn't any family in this part of North Carolina that I could find. I called on a couple of folks around here who I trusted, who I knew could keep their mouths shut about these kind of things, and I found out he'd come up from North Georgia, Stevens County, about three hours southwest of here. It took a few phone calls, but it wasn't hardly a day or two before I was on the phone with Sheriff Tyree Nix in Toccoa, Georgia, asking him if he'd ever heard of a man named Carson Chandler. Good God, he said. Who hadn't heard of that son of a B? Nick said Chambliss always told folks that he was a mechanic, but all Nick's had ever known him for was being arrested on little charges like petty theft and possession of marijuana and controlled substances. I'd had my on him for a long time, he said, but he had to go and blow himself up for us to have something that would stick. What do you mean, I asked. He cooked meth, Nick said. He moved like a squatter back and forth between shacks and abandoned trailers, and we couldn't ever catch him. And then one morning, we had an old house explode about 10 minutes outside the cove. It was Chambliss, what was left of him anyway. Was he hurt bad, I asked. You ain't never looked at him up close, have you? He asked me. No, Sheriff, I said, I haven't. The truth was that at that time, I hadn't laid my eyes on him yet. I couldn't have picked him out of a crowd of two men. Well, that explosion took off something like 40% of his skin and almost killed him. They had to grab big old pieces from his legs and his back and he must have worn a gas mask or something over his face while he cooked it, because you can't quite tell it just by looking at him. But his chest and the right side of his body are just awful looking. If you saw him without clothes on, you'd swear he was a dang mutant. He sighed like he was about to tell me something he either shouldn't or didn't want to. You want to hear the messed up part? He asked. I sure do, I said. He had him a 16-year-old girl in that house when it exploded. A runaway from Mississippi. She died a week later from her burns. Her folks drove up here from Jackson and took her home. It was just a sad story all the way around. What happened to Chambliss? I asked. We tried to get him on second-degree murder, but you know how it is, Sheriff. His court-appointed suit got it argued down to involuntary manslaughter, and the newspaper made that poor girl sound like a conspirator. They only gave him three years. I think he might have served two. That don't seem right, I said. It wasn't right, he said, but like I told you, you know how it is. It was quiet for a second, and I thought he'd finished telling me all he knew about Chandler. And then he cleared his throat. You want to know something else? After he got sent to the Allendale pen down in Alto, he was explaining away those burns by telling folks that God had done it to him. He told them that the hand of God Almighty had come down and set his body afire to purify him from the sins of the world. But what about the meth explosion I asked? How did he explain that? He said that was how God chose to do it. And what about that girl? Well, he didn't ever mention her, not after he got up to the pen anyway. It was like she never existed, he said. But let me tell you this, and you ain't going to believe it when I tell you. 
But the warden told me he couldn't hardly keep that man from setting himself on fire once he got inside the pen. The warden said Chamber started up some kind of cult called the Signs Following. He said they'd hold services right there on the spot, wherever they felt moved. The chapel in their cells, out in the yard. They'd speak in tongues, heal each other, talk about the devil like he lived next door. But the thing was, once they got going, they'd pull out anything flammable they could get a hold of and light it on fire and run it over their hands and hold it right up to their faces. Shaving cream, cologne, cleaning spray. He said if you confiscated lighters and matchbooks to try and keep them from setting all the stuff on fire, they'd up and drink it. Not a single one of them psychos was burned or ever got sick. He said Chandler's got him a little following together, and there was nothing outside of solitary confinement that could keep those folks away from him. He couldn't get nothing out of Chandler's that would explain why they were carrying on like that, but one of his followers told him it was in the Bible. That Jesus told the disciples that after he was gone, they'd be able to do all kinds of dangerous things without getting hurt. He said it would be a sign of their righteousness. I didn't believe him until I got home and opened up my own Bible and did a little searching. And there it was, right there in Mark, just like they said it would be. I heard his desk chair squeak, and I imagined Sheriff Nix leaning all the way back, his boots upon his desk crossed at the ankles, his hat resting in his lap. When he mentioned the book of Mark, my mind suddenly recalled the new sign out by the front of Chambliss' church. I recalled the exact verses on it, Mark 16, 17 through 18. I hung up with Nix, and when I got home that night, I took Sheila's Bible out of her nightstand and flipped through the pages until I found the verses and whispered as I read them out loud. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison... It will not hurt them. They will place their hands on the sick, and they will get well. Things became much clearer to me once I read that. A bad burn from a meth house explosion in North Georgia becomes a sign of holiness and power in western North Carolina. It was Alwyn who told that story, even if that story involved a dead young girl from Mississippi. I suddenly understood the kind of mind that could convince Gillen to set his barn on fire. And I suddenly understood why a group of folks would hide behind newspaper-covered windows while they worshipped. And I finally realized what was in those little crates they carried in and out of that church on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. But other than suspicion, what did I have? What could I do? Arrest a man for exercising his religious freedom? None of it was a reason to knock on church doors, interrupt meetings and services. But now, this time, it wasn't a 16-year-old runaway, but a 13-year-old mute boy who was dead. A boy who couldn't have told Chambliss yes or no or stop, even if he'd wanted to. This time, I knew it was different. Chapter 2. <laughs> um, I would love to take any questions in the time we have left about A Land More Kind Than Home, or my second novel, This Dark Road to Mercy, my third novel, The Notebook, <laughs> or my new novel I wrote that under a pen name <laughs> and my new novel will be out next week or if anybody has any questions about the craft of writing or the business of writing um, those things are very interesting to me as well yes ma'am Um, I don't know. Like my wife, whenever I get asked questions of my wife in the room, I'm like, I don't, what do I say? I don't know how to, how to answer that. <laughs> um, how to find time to write. Um, you know, each experience has been very different. So when I wrote A Land More Kind Than Home, for the most part, I was uh, unmarried and living alone. And I would wake up very, very early in the morning because I was in graduate school in Louisiana and it was blazing hot and I had no money. And so my room was very warm. And my computer, I had like an enormous computer that like just blew heat everywhere. It was like had flames coming out of it. And so I would wake up early and I, I would write. I would wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I would have to be at work. I worked at a little Cajun lunch house. I had to be at work at like 10.30. So I would write for a couple of hours. And then I would sometimes write at night. But I would always get up really, really early. And I maintained that. When I moved to West Virginia, I was working at Bethany College in West Virginia, I would still get up at 6 in the morning, and I would write very early. And then if I had an 8 o'clock class, I would jump in the shower and run up the hill and teach. Um, and then I would usually use my summers and, and not do a lot of socializing and not a lot of travel and just try to, try to write, um, especially when I was working on this book. Then my second novel, I was married by the time I started writing that one. And... It, 
was different in that when you're married and you're, you try to be accountable, I'm not always as accountable as I should be, but you try to be accountable, it's not just like, well, I'll eat dinner at midnight, or I'll just want to eat at night. It's, you know, you have this partnership where you're trying to fit your life with someone else's. And so the rhythm became a little different, but because I'd already sold the book, it hadn't come out yet, I was able to get accepted to some residencies. And so I wrote a lot of This Dark Road to Mercy at residencies called Yaddo in Saratoga Springs, New York, and one called McDowell in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And these residencies, I went to Yaddo for a month and to McDowell for three weeks. And you go, and they, like, feed you. McDowell, at Yaddo, I stayed in an old mansion, and I woke up, and there was a desk, and I just worked. And I went down for breakfast, and they put a little lunch in a bag, and I went down, I got my bag lunch, and I went down for dinner. And I could see the other residents if I chose to. Um, I could get in my car. I had a car with me. I could go into town and get coffee if I chose to. I took a little coffee maker with me, and I was very, insane, very, you know, kind of shut away. And then at the McDowell Colony, you have a bunkhouse where your bed is, and then you have a studio out in the woods. And so my studio was, um, then you have a, a shared area where there's like a communal uh, dining area where all the residents dine together. But my studio was a mile from my bunkhouse, and my studio had a little bed in it. So I'd sleep out there some nights. And they'd bring you lunch. There's a, there's a man uh, who brings you your lunch. And it's like real food. It's like a sandwich and soup, like a good sandwich. Like a sandwich you would get here in, in Chinatown. And then my friends, one of whom is, is here tonight, uh, they own uh, a bed and breakfast up in the northern panhandle called Barn Within. And I was one of their first residents. Uh, and they have this beautiful uh, loft above their barn, and they were kind enough to let me house sit. They're like, you know, feed the chickens and the, the horses and the donkeys and the dogs and, you know, stay here and work. And so I spent a lot of time at their place uh, working and, and trying to edit. The third novel, The Notebook, I don't even remember writing that one. I just remember counting that money when it was published, you know what I'm saying? Um, my third novel, The Last Ballad, which will be out next week, I was married, we had children, uh, we moved while I was writing that. Um, it's been a very different experience. And that, that experience was more partitioned off. I had my time when I wrote, and then my time when I was a dad, and then my time when I was traveling and doing things like this. It wasn't as seamless. My life was not as fluid at that, at that point. But my life was richer, right? My life was richer, my heart was deeper, my experience was more broad, and that made the book better. And so I think a land more kind than home is as good as it can be for a single man who's not married and lives alone and, and is living in, in Lafayette or, or in West Virginia to having that experience. And then Dark Road is the story of a man, written by a man who's not yet a father, writing about fathers. Um, and then The Last Ballad is a man who's been married for almost 10 years and has two little girls and is back home. None of my other books were written in North Carolina. The Last Ballad was written in North Carolina. All of my books have been written about North Carolina. So when I was home writing The Last Ballad, I would rent office space outside of the house. I have an office at home. But it's also like the guest room. It's also where we keep, you know, toys. You know, they're really sharp ones that when you step on them, you're like, well, now I have to kill everybody who lives here. You know, um, it's where we, where we keep, you know, paperwork that I don't fill out. It's where we keep, you know, our checkbooks that we can never find and all these things. And so I rent offices outside of the home, and I rented an office. My worst office I ever rented was in a strip mall. The, the, there were two strip malls. The front one was like a massage parlor, a consignment store, one of those shady tax places where they like sell your social security number, you know? That was the first strip mall in the back. It was like a lighting place, a, a weird gym that like people would like hide the fact they were working out there. It was weird, it was very weird. And then my office was a room like half the size of this stage with like really dirty, nasty carpet. <laughs> one window and no furniture and I had a table with a stand-up desk on top of it and no chair and that's where I wrote a lot of the last battle I didn't even have the internet so my, my options were write lie down on the floor <laughs> with no pillow 
on this nasty carpet. So I got a lot of writing done there, you know. And then I rented a co-working space for a while, and that was okay. That was great to revise. I revised a lot of the last ballot of the co-working space. But you know, my but, but but writing life, like like any life, is always changing with what you're doing, you know. Um, but while writing the last ballad, we had two little girls, and I lost my dad, and we moved back to North Carolina. So the beauty and the tragedy of, of all of those things is in this book, in a way that may not be in these these first two. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Did you find yourself writing in his style, which I presume you did, and then how did you, or did you, um, segue from that to his style? Um, how did I how did I write in Gaines's style and then segue from that? Um, find your own style. Find your own style. I think it's probably like anything. You you can't maintain a facade for very long. Right? That facade may influence you. Like tomorrow, if you were like, you know what, I'm just going to walk like this now. <laughs> By lunch, you'd probably stop walking like that. You know, even if you were convinced that was the coolest walk ever, and you're just going to be walking around town like, that's how I walk now, everybody, it's cool. You know, eventually you're going to stop walking like that, and you're going to walk back the way you normally walk. But maybe you keep a little little bit of that, you know, and you're like, that's how I walk now, right? <laughs> so maybe you've, you've adopted a little bit of it. And that's what it's like to be influenced by a writer you admire. You start mimicking them, and then slowly you realize, probably unconsciously, they're much better than you at what they want to do, at their style, right? You know, if I could write like Toni Morrison, if I could write like you know, these really, really talented, beautifully uh, composed, like Alice McDermott or somebody like that. If I could write, he's got a new book out. Uh, don't buy it, buy mine. If I could, if I could write like that, I, I probably would, but I can't. So I write like me, but I have tried to write like Alice McDermott. I have tried to write like Toni Morrison. And parts of them have fallen away, but, in, but I've kept going in a strange way. I don't know how to describe it in any way other than that. I feel like my strengths are dialogue. Uh, I feel like my, my strengths are like terse descriptions of physical spaces and having characters move through space. And I learned those things from Ernest Gaines. But other things I learned, interiority, having, having a character be still and be thinking about something, I learned that from Thomas Wolfe. You know, so, but I don't really write like Thomas Wolfe at all, but I learned that thing, you know. And so, so whenever you picture me, just picture me walking like that. <laughs> and knowing in my heart that I look like an idiot. <laughs> and that maybe sometimes I still look like an idiot when I, when I try to sit down and write. Because even now, I'll read a book and I'll tell my wife, like, well, my next book's going to be written just like this one. You know, and she's like, that's deeply experimental. You can't do that. That's a really smart book. That's not. That's <laughs> don't, do, don't do that one. Find another one. Find, find another one. Go back to the library. Find somebody else to copy. Stop walking like that. That's, that's not working for anyone, you know. The devil is working on this family. I'm not going to say. This is it's not going to work out. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, Jan. I read the role wrong. Um, do you have a character that whispers to you, talks to you, that uh, wants to be your obsession that you haven't written about, and it just keeps coming back, and you're not ready for him or her or it yet, and it's something that you're going to get to? Not so much. Um, but when I when I'm working on a book, <coughs> I definitely feel like I live with the characters that I'm writing about. You know, when I was writing A Land More Kind Than Home, those people felt incredibly real to me. And so when my agent or my editor would suggest revisions or rewrites, I could do them really quickly. And my agent at one point said, gosh, I can't believe you can write this quickly. And I would tell him, I've been living with these people for eight years. Like, I know how to get them to walk from a car into the house. I know how, that, that, how they look doing that. Or I know what they would say when they want to eat dinner early. You know, I know how they would, they would share that with somebody. 
Um, and then in my second novel, the, the, one of the main characters is a little girl named Easter, and she's, she's 13. No, she's 11. And uh, I heard her voice so clearly from the very, very beginning, before, long before I began writing about her. Um, in this novel, I didn't hear the voices with the last ballad of my new book. I didn't hear the voices as much as I heard. This sounds so corny. But as much as I felt the spirits of these people and the struggle of their lives, and you know, this but this new novel is, is written about a mill strike that took place in my hometown. And I can go to these places, they're still there. So I can walk the ground they walked, I can go to the places they were. And it's a spiritual kind of uh, surge that I that I feel when I think about these people. They feel very real to me as real as the characters who speak to me. Um, this new book that I have in mind, I haven't started writing it yet, but I do feel the stirrings of a character trying to tell me something. Um, a friend of mine is a writer named Joel McCorkle, and she says that she knows it's time to let go of a project when the next project is calling you and, and asking you to pick it up. And so you kind of tidy the previous one up. And I'm ready to do that with this, with this new book. And I, I'm seeing... Uh, Scenes, kind of. I'm, I'm feeling this this character uh, in an interesting way, but but not really someone that I've carried in my mind for a number of years who the, whose voice has accumulated. But when I'm in the in the throes of a book, I definitely feel like I live with these people. What's a part of the writing process that moves your head most? I mean, uh, Alexander Pope said that you know half the fun is in the polishing. So is mm -hmm. it the polishing? Is it in There's an old saying that, that says, uh, writing is hell, not writing is hell. The only good thing is having written. <laughs> so that's probably the thing I enjoy the most, is having, having written. Um, finishing it. But, you know, what I enjoy the most, and if you are a writer, something I encourage you to do is when I have a eureka moment, like in this novel, The Last Ballad, which is, uh, it's for sale, Four Seasons is selling it. They're the only store in the country right now selling this book. It's not even out till October 3rd. But in writing this novel, there were a number of moments where I'm writing about a character, and then I'll, and I would realize, they know this other person in the novel. I didn't know they knew each other. That's a whole connection in the story. And it would just be this mind-blowing thing that I didn't do. The novel, the story did that. Those characters did that. And it felt successful. And anything that makes your book feel real, that, that you're not in control of, that makes it feel real. That makes it feel viable. It makes it feel worthy of being shared and read. Um, and when I have moments like that, or I have a moment where I know I've nailed a scene, or I know I've nailed a line of dialogue, or some kind of narration, I get up. I get up from my desk. And um, I may go downstairs and see what the kids are doing downstairs, or I may go run an errand. When I had an office, I would go outside and just walk around the building a lot. Right? There was a little drainage pond in the back behind the building. I would just stare at that. It was like a, a bunch of cats who lived back there. I would, I would look at them sometimes. But I would but I would I would just be in that moment of what it felt like to feel full of a successful moment. Because you don't get a lot of those. Most writing is like the man oh that's bad. The young man Young man. Nah, that's what most writing is for me. I'm not something that I edit while I go. Sometimes I'll just hammer out a thousand words that I know are bad just to have something on the page. But those moments when you know it's working, I always get up because I want to come back to the desk when it feels good. So I leave in a, in a, in a warm spot so I enter again in a warm spot. Not the next day, but maybe 15 minutes later. And, I, and I'm going back into something that feels hot and real. The worst thing I can do is get up when it's cold, when I know it's not working. Um, because I want to be a working writer, which means I work every day. I work either on my writing or on my career every day, so I have to do it. You know, Because 
many, many people have jobs much harder, more physically or intellectually demanding than mine. They do it every day, so I need to do it every day too. But there are days when it just doesn't, it's just not there. And uh, a friend of mine's a writer named Jess Walter, and he's got great novels and story collection, he's got a nonfiction book, and he writes essays. And I asked him, I said, you know, you've written so many things, how do you write so many genres? He said, because I always believe you can write something. It may not be the novel you're supposed to be writing under deadline, but it could be that article about you know, the world's best corn dog at the county fair that you've been thinking about writing. Write that. So it's like when you go to the gym, and maybe you don't want to lift weights that day, walk on the treadmill. Maybe you don't want to walk on the treadmill, you know, jump rope. Do something. And that's how I think of writing. <coughs> yeah. How are you supposed to know that, like, Going into a career as a writer and choosing not to do a traditional career path is the right thing to do? Um, that's a very great, honest question. And I wish I had a good answer for you. And I'm not being flippant or dismissive. I wish I had a good answer for you. I still don't know that this is my career. I don't know. You know, I've had three books out. Um, right now, we're okay. But, you know, if y'all don't buy this book, <laughs> we have to live in our van in West Back Alley. But, you know, I have, a, I have a PhD, and I knew that I can hopefully always teach somewhere. And, you know, writing was kind of my hobby, and now it's become my job. When your hobby becomes your job, there's an, a, a set of pressures that are there with any job. But my job is dependent not only on how much I can produce, but how well my product is received, right? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of pressure. So I always have some kind of fallback, whether that's my wife's career, <laughs> or, or going back to the classroom full time, which I, lo I love teaching. I just love writing more right now, but I may like teaching more later. Um, you know, I don't know how to tell you to do that, but I didn't, I didn't pursue writing as a full-time career until I had two books under contract. My wife was practicing law in Morgantown, and I had like a part-time teaching gig that I could fall back on um, that wasn't a ton of responsibility. And even then, my wife had to convince me to do it. She said, her name's Mallory, she said, you know, it's never, it's always been your dream to write for a living. It's never been your dream to teach four classes a semester of ethnobiology. It's never been your dream. And you like it, and you love it, and it's a great place, and you got a lot of friends there. But that's not your dream. So, you can do this now. Maybe you can't do it forever. And maybe I still won't do it forever. But I can do it now. Right? I'm doing it right now. Um, so I, I think that you just have to have faith in yourself. And, and, and Ernest Gaines, my mentor, said he gave himself 10 years when he was much younger. He said, I'm going to give myself 10 years, and I'm going to work my tail off, and I'm going to eat really bad food, and I'm going to leave, live really cheaply and sleep on as many couches as I can. And, and if after 10 years, if I can't make it, I'm going to do something else. Because he had a college degree. He could have done a lot of things. I'm going to do something else. And so set challenges for yourself like that. But I can tell you this. The hardest thing about publishing a book is writing a book. That's the hardest thing. It's easy to get an agent. It's not easy and likely are very different things. It was easy to send a query letter to New York City. Right? That's easy. It's easy to sell the book. I don't sell it. My agent does. The hard thing was writing the book. So if you realize what the hard thing is and know you can do it, then you're probably going to have enough faith in yourself to step out and, and try it professionally, try it full time. And if you can write, you can work. You may not be writing you know, best-selling novels that support you and your family, but you might be hustling. And I hustle, right? I don't just write novels. I write articles. I work for magazines. I do events like this that I'm very fortunate to be invited to. But I'm not just in my room writing every day for eight hours a day. I couldn't that wouldn't be sustainable for my family. Um, I have friends, I got a friend who's a designer in Austin, a graphic arts designer, who's 
If you looked at his life, you'd be like, man, you do the branding for Southern Comfort, you do Austin City Limits, you hang out with Anthony Bourdain, you know Jack White, you know all these cool people. And he would say, I probably work 80 hours a week, you know, I'm stressed, I hustle all the time, I've got 59 projects in the air, but he's doing it. You know, and I got a friend in Atlanta who's a jazz musician who's the same way. He did the music for the trailer for this, for my, my new book, and he just hustles. And um, early on when I was becoming a reader, I was inspired by biographies I read of athletes, like um, Pistol Pete Maravich and Larry Bird and Clyde Frazier and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, all these old school basketball players. And what I loved about them was how they gave themselves over to trying to be great at something. And that's really what you have to do. At what point did you decide it was time to get an agent? At what point did I decide it was time to get an agent? So I was in graduate school, and I was in a, in a writing program, surrounded by professors who were published authors, and they were able to advise me about how to get an agent. And I went and, and, and got some reference books from the, from the um, bookstore about agents and query letters and things like that. I scoured the internet for examples of query letters. I looked at agents. Um, uh, submission guidelines online to see what kind of work they wanted and how they wanted it to be submitted. And I just thought, you know, I've written a book. I think it's the best I can make it be right now. And for it to be better, I need help. And maybe an agent can provide that help if he or she decides to work with me. And uh, so I began querying agents in the, the, the summer of 2008. And uh, got an agent almost immediately. My first day at Bethany College, we were having faculty meetings the week before school started. And I checked my email in the lobby before the, my first meeting began. And it was like, Dear Wiley, I am big time New York City agent. I would like to represent your novel. Um, can you please call me as soon as possible? And I remember stepping back and looking around at all these strangers and being like, I'm not going to be here long. <laughs> you know? Because the goal was always if I can get a book deal, a school in North Carolina will hire me. You know, because I had just moved to West Virginia, and I ended up loving West Virginia. We, we left West Virginia in the fall of 2013, and probably a couple of times a week, we're like, we should make West Virginia. <laughs> you know, we, we miss our friends in our, the area we lived in desperately. But that was always the goal, and I was thrilled to have a teaching job out of graduate school. I worked so hard to get that job, but I wanted to be in North Carolina because my soul had been crying out for it for five years. And my wife, who was finishing law school at the time, was about to take the West Virginia State Bar Exam. And I was terrified that she was going to take the West Virginia Bar Exam, and then I was going to get a job in North Carolina, and she's going to take the North Carolina Bar Exam, or leave me, right? <laughs> Which she ended up doing, not the leaving part, the taking the North Carolina Bar Exam. Um, I spent some time up at their farm during that as well. She's like, I'm studying for the bar, so you have to leave. Maybe forever, but at least until I'm done studying for the bar exam. Um, but that agent tried for a year and a half to sell my book, and everybody said no. Right? It was it, everybody who saw it said no. And during that time, another agent read one of my stories in a literary magazine, a very small magazine. And he he emailed me and said, "I don't know if you have an agent. If you do, disregard this. If you don't, give me a call. If you do now and you don't later, keep me in mind." And so after a year and a half, I called him and said, "Hey, you know, you emailed me months and months and months ago, maybe a year ago." And I no longer have an agent. My book's been rejected. Will you look at it? He said, yeah, I'll look at 20 pages. I can't promise anything. I sent him 20 pages. A few days later, he said, I'll see the whole thing. I can't promise anything. And then a few days later, he said, okay, I'll start working with you on this. I can't promise anything. Because my, my agent is old school. He is burn it down old school. And just old New York publishing. His, his agency is about to celebrate its 40th year. So he's, it's old school New York publishing. And he said, I'm not your agent. I'm someone who's working on this book with you. So at any time, you can stop. If you don't like my suggestions, if you don't like the tempo, the pace, you can stop. And so we worked on it for 10 months. And around Halloween in 2010, he called me and said, I think we've got the books in a good enough shape. Do you have an idea for a second book? I want to be your agent. After he'd invested... I mean, I'm, I'm sending him 100 pages every couple of days, and he's firing back responses, and it's just going back. It's almost like a conversation. And um, I did have an idea for a second book, because I thought my first novel was failed, because everybody had said no. 
So I had an idea, and he got, he got me a two-book deal to the first editor who saw it. And so, you know, I knew I was ready to get an agent, but I wasn't ready to find the right agent. You know? and, and, and I always tell people, know your agent, because your agent works for you, and you don't work for your agent. And if an agent shows interest in you, don't act like that's the only person to dance with at this dance. There are other people who may be better partners than this person. And, and don't jump at the first one. And really study and, say, and ask yourself, are the books this person represents, are they like mine? Is this agent interested in building careers or in making money? And those are two very different tracks that agents pursue. Maybe one more. Maybe one more question. <laughs> Um, since I've been writing, if I, if I found themes and archetypes that I'm surprised by, I'm surprised by the degree I write about women, strong women. I'm not, I'm surprised by that, obviously because of my gender, um, but also how they, how they seem to come to dominate what I'm writing about. So my first novel, Adelaide's the strongest character, she's a, the strongest woman, but she's also the strongest character. And then in my second novel, there's a young girl named Easter who's just a rock star. I mean, she's like Scout Finch and Ellen Foster and, I don't know, Jess Kirkman from I'm One of You Forever all rolled into one character. And then um, in this novel, Ella May, in my new book, is just a life force, you know. Um, there's, there's a host of other strong, strong female characters. So that surprised me. That's something I don't think I realized until this third novel. Like, gosh, I'm really writing about female characters, and I feel like I can, I can write about them pretty well, and I don't really know why that is. I have suspicions, but I don't know why that is. So that surprised me a little bit. Um, things that I don't particularly enjoy? Hmm. That's a tough question. I don't particularly enjoy uh, endings, like trying to decide when the book is over and what the ending is. So for Landmore Condon kind of Home, Adelaide, the way she closes the book, that was written very quickly toward the end of writing it. My agent suggested it. He said, Adelaide's got to finish this book. She's got to bring some hope to this book. And I thought, that is so corny. That is the worst suggestion, agent. And I tried it. It's my favorite part of the book. And then in This Dark Road to Mercy, the ending kept changing. Like, I thought the ending, if anybody's read it, was going to be in St. Louis. And then it wasn't. And then I thought the ending was going to be on this playground. And it wasn't. And then it was somewhere else. And the ending just kept extending on and kept going on and on. With the last ballad, I knew what the ending was going to be. I didn't know what the last words were going to be, but I knew how the book was going to conclude. But that book, ending that book was like ending a relationship for me. Like, when I... When I knew that I had the final line, this sounds so indulgent, but I was really emotional. When I knew, like, this book is done, you know, this is, this is it, this five-year journey, and there's all this stuff that happened, and I know that's going to be it. And I hated it in a way, too, because it was over, you know, and, and as hard as that book was to write, it was such a joy to live with, you know, because the writing of the book and the living with the book are separate things, and it was such a joy to live with that book. And so I was, I was disappointed when it was, when it was over. I was proud of the ending, but disappointed when it was over. Were any of you here for Ben Banker's discussion of the Cult House? Mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, Norma Ruddy. Did yeah. anybody go to the Norma Ruddy yeah. film? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that book. So you can see how the, this is a book you've got to read. I, I love all three of these, but I really, really like this book. Maybe because I'm sort of an adopted West Virginian. <laughs> All these scholars, they feed upon them. Hey, listen, tomorrow night is the tie that binds. Wiley Cash is going to get the Appalachian Heritage Writers Award. There are some other really fine writers in the state. West Virginia Library people will be there, and President Hendricks will be there. Join us. For now, go and get some food or something.